Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Wirt, um, and I'm the director of the Thames Valley AI Hub. Um, thank you all so much for coming this evening uh, to find out about some of the exciting research which is going on at the University of Reading and how you can engage with their students to gain a fresh perspective to your business. We are very lucky today to hear from our keynote speaker, Dr. Varun Oja, a lecturer in computer science at the University of Reading. Um, after his talk about uh, quarter to six, we will open the floor to questions before hearing from Professor Richard Mitchell and Rakesh Pankamia about the different engagement mechanisms which are available to businesses to work with our students. This will be followed by a Q&A session and we'll finish the event by quarter past six. So before we start, I'm just gonna go over some housekeeping. Um, please do use the chat function for general discussion and any questions you have. Uh, I'll keep an eye on questions throughout the event and we'll ask them during the Q&A session. You're very welcome to leave your cameras on, but please ensure your microphones are on mute. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please email us at our usual address, tvaihub at reading.ac.uk and we'll be monitoring the inbox throughout this event. We are recording the event today, and this will be posted on the Thames Valley AI Hub website under the library tab after the event. Please note this will not show the chat function. You can find recordings of most of our previous events on there as well. We have been having some technical difficulties with our website recently, but it's now back up and running. So if you've not been able to get on it recently, then please do go and check it out. In the next few days, we will circulate an email with the slides and a short questionnaire about the webinar. This feedback is anonymous and helps us improve not only our events, but the overall content of the hub. The hub is for the community, so it's really important to understand what you think. So please do fill that in if you can. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Varun Oja. Dr. Oja's work spans a decade of research in artificial intelligence and has had real world impact in a range of sectors, including pharmaceutical, environment and hydrology. He's reported important publications in reputed international journals and conferences. So I'm really looking forward to hearing his talk. Thank you so much for coming today, Varun, um, and over to you. Thank you, thank you, Sarah, and thank you all attendants. Um, so as Sarah said, um, I'm going to present today my research. Uh, actually, it's a research with collaboration with the different AI researchers. Uh, here in, in Reading or uh, elsewhere where I worked uh, previously. So it's a kind of a comprehensive work of uh, over, uh, as said, uh, over a decade. So what I'm going to uh, do is that I'm walk through different application areas uh, which I have worked in. So the mostly the, uh, the work I have done is like applying artificial intelligence to different problems. So I will try to fire up my slides, uh, which is obviously a technical uh, thing to do. Uh, let me try to see where is the share button. So if you can see my screen, uh, I hope you can. Yes, I can see that, Baron. Perfect. Okay, so uh, as you see the title which I have given, I think is a very provocative title. Anything repeatable is replaceable by AI. And as you know that this, uh, in today's world, we are talking um, that how AI is going to uh, run our future world. So in, in, in general, machine learning, AI, and all this terminology we, we, which you hear day to day. So they work on the task we human uh, do regularly. So what we do as a human regularly is we are re repeating some things. So when I put this title, anything repeatable is replaceable by AI, I was thinking whether this title is absolutely correct or not. Uh, it, it is absolutely true, this title, but I think there, sh there should be something addition to this title is that anything not repeatable can also be replaceable by AI. So AI is becoming very, very powerful tool for our future uh, uh, society and economy and everything. So I put also two words, opportunities and challenges. The question is, what are the opportunities? Obviously in a generic sense, opportunities of AI is huge. It's in every walks of our life, in every sector you think. So the AI is everywhere, like today's smartphones and, uh, and, and all the applications you see on the web, they have in background a huge amount of AI algorithms running. Like you go on shopping and you are chatting with a chatbot. So that's a, a, a AI algorithm, natural language processing is working behind. Then the following word is challenges. What are the challenges we have? So there, the challenges has various dimensions. If you want to think, the the dimension of challenges is that with, uh, like most controversial one is like whether AI is going to replace jobs and 
uh, or whether it is going to generate jobs. So I'm not going to talk in those ethical aspects uh, in, in this talk, but I'm going to discuss in terms of uh, uh, challenges in terms of how as a AI uh, a practitioner or a person or from industry or a generic non-computer uh, non science or non-AI person, you think how I will use AI. So the challenges I will I'll be going to discuss in that sense. So I will be discussing the applications and then I will be referring the challenges. So the agenda for today's talk is these three questions which we are going to answer. What are the AI tools like the scope of artificial intelligence? Then what are the problems uh, these AI algorithms or AI techniques solves? And how do they, do they solve the problem? So these are the three key questions uh, in this talk we are going to uh, discuss. So these three questions which I put in, what do you want to know? So as an AI researcher, I have a different answer to these three bullet points which I have written. Or as an industry person, you have uh, three uh, different perspective how you read this question. So if you are a person who wants AI to use, want to use AI in your applications or in your industry or in your science, you want to ask question like that. Do you want to understand data? Do you want, want to make some prediction or forecasting? Or do you want to optimize some systems? So as an AI researcher, what I will do is I will answer the question or I will investigate, how do I understand your data? How I will make prediction and how I will optimize your system? So these are the three different questions. And these three different questions actually is, is, is like a three different kind of problem you can solve. So the challenges here for a person who wants to use AI is to basically try to answer these three questions that what I'm going to do with the things, uh, or if I'm going to use AI in our industry or in our applications or in our science, what actually I'm going to do, which question I'm going to answer. So if you find the first thing for you would be to find this uh, one of these questions you want to answer. Obviously you can't answer three questions uh, simultaneously, but you want to basically query yourself that what is this? Like, do we just want to understand our data or we want to do some forecasting like predicting price of our products in the future, or we just want to kind of optimize our system? Uh, what are the variables do we have? or settings we have that we want to optimize. So these are the key questions as, an, uh, as a person who want to use AI or apply AI in their uh, discipline or in their industry, they want to ask this key question first. And then we can talk as an AI researcher, you come to me and then we can discuss that how we will solve. So, so with that, I think uh, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through some of the AI uh, kind of a spec in, in the spectrum of AI, what are the tools and techniques we have first, and then I will show you the examples. So the artificial intelligence, uh, as you see, like is a whole uh, a spectrum. And in this artificial intelligence, all these words like machine learning, deep learning, data science you hear, they fall in this kind of uh, in this Venn diagram. So when you hear machine learning, machine learning is a part of artificial intelligence. It's like a, a subset of artificial intelligence. It's one of the tools you are going to use. Then deep learning has a principle how machine learning works and the deep learning is a part. It's like a sub, sub area of the research people do in machine learning. Then data science is the whole world. Is like uh, any discipline, any industry, or any type of uh, uh, domain you want to uh, think of can fall into data science. Means any, any system, any sensors, any process which can generate some type of data, or even you don't know as like a, uh, as an industry personnel, you might don't know that you have some good data uh, with you and what kind of AI algorithms can be used. So there are various occasions when I interact with industry. They, in fact, they have a, a precious valuable data, but they have no idea that they have it. So the data science help us understand this, uh, uh, this aspect, that what are the problems or what are the, uh, the opportunities we have where we can exploit our current setting or current uh, uh, system uh, so that we can benefit uh, uh, in terms of economic or in terms of uh, providing uh, a social impact and so on and so on. So the data science, what it does, it, it uses uh, the tools and techniques from artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. 
Okay, so we, we, that is this whole spectrum of uh, how these artificial intelligence and data science things organizes. Now we come to this question of what is artificial intelligence then? So I tend to find this, uh, uh, like there are several definitions of AI. Uh, it's a very, uh, a subject in itself to study how to define artificial intelligence. So one of the, uh, the definition which I like is, uh, is to create intelligent machines that think and act like human beings. I have a little bit of objection with this, uh, uh, this definition is that the question that how to define intelligent, is it humans are intelligent? Because what we are doing here is making an analogy that the machines we will create that will be uh, functioning or, uh, or thinking or acting like human beings. The question is whether human beings are intelligent or, or just human beings just react to some kind of stimuli they receive from the environment. So if that is the consideration or this, if that is my opposition to the word intelligence, then I can put my definition of artificial intelligence like the following to create machines that thinks and act like human beings. So the, the main idea is that we want to simulate or emulate uh, uh, how human behave or how human work or how human react when they approach to a problem. So if we can manage to do or create an artificial system, whether it can be a software or it can be a robots or something that can, th that try to emulate human behavior. So uh, let's see some example uh, where uh, we can create such machine. So if you see this example, this is a micro mouse computation. It's, uh, it's conducted every year. And this is a, a, a very good example of several dimensions of artificial intelligence or the, uh, the area of work or research we do in artificial intelligence that this micro mouse competition displays. So you try to observe this very carefully what this mouse is doing. It's trying to search for food in this complex mesh. So it, it has a goal, it has given some kind of a ground truth or a goal for search. So it is doing something called searching. So it, now it's what is doing is exploration. So we are using some kind of technique where this mouse is exploring the whole space. We can do is we can optimize or we can provide some efficiency to, to this mouse to explore less space. So we will save time. So there is a the possibility of efficiency. So at this moment, this mouse is doing an exhaustive exploration. And there are, uh, there are area of uh, research in artificial intelligence, which minimizes this exploration. So I hope this mouse will be able to find this uh, goal. Yeah, here you go. And now it's returning back to the uh, start position. So there is an uh, initial state, initial condition when the AI starts. So we need to feed it with some kind of initial thing. And then we have to provide a goal or a, some kind of a ground truth for AI to work. So we are basically defining a problem for AI to work. Now use, I will, uh, I will see this, what this uh, mouse is doing. It will come back to, the, uh, to its owner. And then it will try to uh, like, you can think of deployment. Now it is, at this moment, it is learning. So this is an example of planning, robotics, learning and search and, and so on and so on. So various kind of, uh, of AI uh, systems you can think of this mouse is doing. Now, once it has learned, what is your task to de deploy your system on some web so, so that your users or your um, uh, people who want to forecast something they can use. So at the end of uh, all this exploration, this mouse is going to come back and uh, his or her ma master will then, let's say, do some magic. So this mouse has learned now. And this should find this uh, goal in a very fast and efficient way because it has learned and planned. Just watch carefully, otherwise you will miss. Okay, so you see, so this mouse has displayed a uh, kind of uh, I mean, even this task is very difficult for a human to do. 
So we, we are able to build uh, systems that can basically uh, uh, solve problems for us. So these are the toy examples, but we can uh, think of uh, practical things. Now, this is one of the practical example where we are approaching in the future, we want to de uh, deploy a self-driving car. And this is a uh, example from Tesla. So it's a real uh, kind of a video pro I downloaded it from YouTube. So this car is going to do a very difficult maneuver. Uh, it's called left turn. Uh, obviously it's for Americans uh, to understand it's a left turn or in the Europe. In the UK, we will do right turn would be the difficult. So it's kind of doing a scene understanding. It's trying to observe the whole environment around it. And then it's going to do a le this left turn. So that's a test scenario for self-driving car. So we are not there yet. The, the goal of AI researchers is to build a, like build a trust of uh, our society so that in the future we will use a self-driving car. Uh, the, the thing is that uh, human drivers, they also do make, uh, make lots of error. But at this moment, we are not 100% uh, sure that the self-driving car will not make more errors than what as a human we do. And there are lots of other issues like legal issues and uh, ethical issues around self-driving car deployment. So we will be there in let's say, 20 to 50 years, I'm not, uh, if, if it is too far, I'm saying, but my guess is that we'll be soon uh, using self-driving car. Now we come back to what the self-driving car is doing is most of the tasks the self-driving car have, or the components in the self-driving car is machine learning. So machine learning is that learning from example. So this car, uh, actually there's a deep learning behind it, which has uh, learned from example by examples. Like we might be thinking of that we will feed all the video recordings of human drivers. So if we can collect all the, uh, all the videos uh, or the images uh, as an example for this uh, self-driving car to learn as, a, as an example, and then uh, the self-driving car will be trained like how we train, uh, like how humans learn or how we train our, our dog. So that's how this machine learning will work. We will feed examples and examples and say that you are doing correct, you are doing right, you know, you are doing a wrong. And so that is like a error correction will happen with this machine learning system. And finally it will learn or uh, it will try to behave like as a, uh, as a living being do. So this is an example where this uh, learning is happening in the, uh, in the animal world. So this dog, this uh, cute girl is teaching this, uh, this dog how to open a door. So now after showing two examples, this dog is able to open the door. It is no difference how the machine learning works. So the deep learning takes these things a little further. What the deep learning does is that it puts more and more layers or like a, creates a massively complex network so that the, so that the learning become powerful. So you can think of that the machine learning when we uh, is a framework, the definition of framework when we provide examples for any system or any type of algorithm that will learn from the examples. So the deep learning is particularly is a neural network or a, a neural network, if I say, uh, if, if this word is difficult to understand, is like the, the, uh, the representation of human brain in an artificial sense. So the deep learning also takes examples, mostly images, and then it tried to predict that, or let's say for this example is a classification example, that whether this image is a cat and dog or whether this is a pedestrian or a car or is a street light is green or a street light is red in self-driving car example. So th these are the tasks deep learning is doing. But the application area doesn't stay here. Any, any, ex any kind of data you create or the images you can create a, uh, and then you can create a, a diff, uh, architecture of deep learning, like several layers, and that will be able to predict the task or do the classification or, or scene identification task. So the, the possibility of using deep learning is huge in different domain. And mind it here, this deep learning is working on unstructured data. So the images are unstructured data, which means that there is a no inherent uh, uh, structure to it or not, not a, like a, a tabulations or table. 
So it's a much more difficult task which deep learning is, is able to solve. So if I try to kind of uh, summarize uh, this uh, uh, machine learning and deep learning or artificial intelligence per se, like tools and techniques, something is in a, we come to, uh, to the concept of data science. So the data science, uh, if you can think of that, it is a pipeline of knowledge discovery process. So uh, the data here, you can think of any kind of data or you, you even at this moment, when if you are an industry or if you are a researcher who want to use AI, you do not know what kind of data you have or how to formulate your problem in, in sense of that it is machine learning usable or AI usable. So you want to create some kind of a target data from, from your application domain and you want to process it, then you are going to use this machine learning, deep learning, all these things, uh, something called data mining. So that that the place where you would be using, uh, 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 like say a neural network or, or some kind of a deep learning algorithm, then you're going to discover some kind of knowledge or you want to understand your data, what is the what your data is saying. Is there any pattern to your data set? So you, are, are, you try to find, kind of knowledge you want. So any questions you ask about your company or your industry or your discipline, you will be able to find from your data. So you want to analyze this pattern. So basically this, what you see here in this diagram is basically a pipeline of a knowledge discovery process or a machine learning approach or AI process as you want to call it. So another, uh, domain is all these algorithms uh, are, we are saying here, they work, they, they need optimization. They have certain parameters, variables, they need optimizations. So we need, need to uh, reach to this goal, like this mouse example, that has a goal that it wants to reach to the, to the uh, defined goal. And while doing that, it needs some kind of optimization. So in your, it, it can be a neural network optimization problem or your system or your discipline have certain equations, certain functions or some behavior that need some kind of setting, some kind of balancing that will, uh, that will if you are good enough or you are trying to do a good guess, you will be able to reach to a solution. So that is kind of a task of optimization. This falls in the whole spectrum of the AI. So the, the definition of optimization, uh, if you kind of see in the contour kind of uh, uh, diagram I have presented in the, in the shadow. So the, the, the definition of optimization is that any problem you can think of that has a number of variables, number of influencing factors that need to attend certain values in order to find a solution. So you want to stabilize your system. Let's say you are doing lots of things in your, in your problem and you want to reach to a certain uh, equilibrium where the, the, that equilibrium will give you maximum output. So that, this kind of problem or thinking if you have or trying to solve such kind of problem that falls in the area of the optimization. So what we have seen so far, we have seen deep learning, machine learning, optimization and data science. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, use all of these techniques and try to apply in different disciplines. And so over the year, I had opportunity to work with various researchers in different disciplines. And I, I quite enjoyed working with, uh, I mean, uh, as you can see my application area, there's no restriction to it, or, or you can think of this as completely outrageous that you are working on physics, biology, hydrology, climate science, engineering, pharmaceutical, uh, civil engineering, but what is the core uh, behind all of this is that you are using these tools, this, this uh, limited set of tools or the principles of artificial intelligence that is able to solve different types of problems. So for me as an AI researcher, these are disciplines uh, is only a problem. And if I am able to formulate or define this problem in such a way that uh, AI tools and techniques can be applied Therefore, I can apply artificial intelligence to solve this problem. So there are nine topics I'm going to discuss. So I will start with the engineering. So by training, I'm an engineer. Uh, so in fact, my first research project was an engineering project. Uh, it's an electronics engineering. 
And the work we did is to protect the health and life of uh, sewer pipeline workers. So I was a very junior researcher at the time. And to me, it sounds like a very noble and uh, uh, a work uh, which is a very influencer for society. So I was quite interested in this work and believe me, it was a very complex work. So the work was is to analyze, uh, to identify different patterns of, uh, of, of toxic gases. So if you mix a, uh, like a sewer pipeline, what happens is our Suez, it goes into sewer pipeline and they generate lots of uh, gases. Uh, the gases, they are harmful gases. For example, they are ammonia, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, hydrogen sulfide. Hy hydrogen sulfide, for example, uh, is a rotten egg smell, is like hydrogen sulfide. Methane and carbon monoxide. So these are very poisonous gases. If we are not careful enough, if a, 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 a sewer worker is entering to a sewer pipeline and if he doesn't know that there is like a uh, the limit of gases has reached to a toxicity uh, as, a, as a hazardous level, like uh, it can basically kill person. So we want to kind of uh, uh, drop a sensor so that we can monitor what is the uh, percentage or what is the level of this hazardness of these gases so that we are uh, safe to enter into the pipeline. So the uh, the task, if you see this pipeline, um, uh, this process here is an AI knowledge discovery process. So we collect data, gas mixture from a real uh, sewer system. Then we have this array of sensor sensors, the different sensors, and we do some kind of electronics. And these sensors uh, generate some kind of input for a neural network. And the neural network learns this pattern that what is the toxicity level of this uh, gases. And then it's when it when it learns you can drop this neural network to the sewer pipeline and this neural network will be able to predict what is the level of each of these gases then you can carry out your work so uh, it was a two years nice project and what we wanted is we wanted to develop something like this this was the objective our, uh, like having a nice beautiful device but uh, since we were a junior researcher we managed to develop something like an in-house prototype and it worked quite well like it was able to detect uh, 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 gases with certain accuracy i hope it, it 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 could have been a marketable product but as a researcher we care up up to pr prototype uh, if we have industry collaboration, we can uh, make it a marketable thing. Okay, now I jump to the pharmaceutical work. Uh, as I said in some of my commentary uh, when we posted the advertisement for this talk, that this uh, talk would be a roller coaster. So there will be different discipline and this concept will be shifting. So the pharmaceutical industry is a very uh, uh, kind of uh, costly or I so lack of a good word, I would say money-making industry. Uh, they have a, a very complex system of drug manufacturing. So they have a big social cause and as a big industrial uh, system as well. What they want, the, the manufacturing of drug is a very expensive business. You want to reduce the number of variables you have in your system in order to be cost effective. So you want to identify what kind of process variable you can get rid of, or what are the, uh, the drugs properties you can use. So there are uh, several aspects in pharmaceutical industry you want to optimize or you want to learn. So the goal of, uh, in, in a very generic sense, goal of, uh, of, of a pharmaceutical industry is to take uh, some kind of a powder, pharmaceutical powder, and convert them into, let's say, pills. So that is the kind of you know, uh, initial condition and the final solution. And in, in kind of in a, a little bit detailed way, you have, the, uh, you have to understand what are the particle properties of this powder, what are the type of materials you have, what are their densities, what are the shape of the particles, then you have what are the powder you have, what are their flowability, compactability, and so on and so on. And also the machine related problems, what are the roller gap, roller speed. So there are different uh, uh, variables involved. And so from powder, you create ribbons and then you create granules and then you kind of compact them to make tablets. And so this whole process is very complex process and you want to reduce uh, as many as variable you want. So what, 
we did in our research is that we pick a very simple example or a, or only tiny uh, part of this whole process, which is called uh, dye filling. Like the filling a dye where you can compact uh, the powders in order to make the drugs or the tablet. So this ex experiment we did with uh, filling powder into some kind of a dye. And what we want is that what is the speed of the shoe uh, would be, what are the, the mass of this powder should be, because if you can reduce the mass uh, in, in, a, in a drug or whether you can deposit appropriate amount of uh, mass of a, of a uh, powder in for a manufacturing drug, all of these factors influence how this drug's going to behave or, or impact the health. So we, we want to learn. So we did some analysis on this and we reduced the variables. The another kind of work we did is that uh, if we produce this drug, how uh, what is the the uh, how much percentage of molecules of this drug will be dissolved? So that is also a, a factor we can uh, take an account of. So what we did is we collected a huge data set, 300 descriptor of drugs properties. So we have the uh, the proteins uh, descriptor of the drug, formulation characteristics, and so on and so on. These are not uh, known to me these words uh, because I'm an AI researcher. But when we do collaborate, we understand all of these things. So after collecting all this uh, data set, uh, basically 300 uh, uh, variables, which is quite a huge, what you what your goal is to reduce number of variables here in order to identify what percentage of molecule will be, will be dissolved. So you want to learn this in order to, uh, to have efficiency in your system. So you can do some, uh, produce some kind of uh, uh, machine learning algorithms. You can train a neural network or you can train different type of, don't worry about this different words here. A neural tree is my own algorithm, multi-layer perceptron MLP. And then there are like a, a other, multi-layer perceptron, which are all neural networks. So you train a neural network with a different number of features. So the features is like you are reducing the variables, 17, 15, 11, seven, and four. So what we found is that out of this 300 variable, uh, even with the four variable, four most important variable, you will be able to predict with a, a certain accuracy. So the uh, RMSC is a root mean square error, is the accuracy we want to achieve the lower is the better. So the goal is to achieve a zero error. So here with the four variables, we achieve 15.2 uh, accuracy or the error. With the 15 variable, we achieve 13.2. Now it is a trade-off. It's a trade-off. You want to use 15 variables and have a an higher accuracy. You want to use four variables and you uh, want to have a little bit lower accuracy. So it is like a trade-off. You want to judge because this 15 variables, there could be many variables which are easy or uh, very uh, less co uh, costly. So you can achieve higher accuracy, but if, if you have like a, some variable in this 15, which is very costly. So you want to uh, go for this model, which is last one, type two, three, which is only using four variables. So you can decide. So this analysis is called feature selection or feature engineering. And it's a very important uh, dimension of artificial intelligence where you want to reduce cost of any system. The another uh, natural questions comes from this all exercise is that if you get uh, these things done, how you can uh, kind of uh, understand how this prediction was made. So the explainability uh, in AI the, the word I'm saying very loosely now here, the explainability is an extremely uh, interesting or challenging task in, uh, in machine learning or AI uh, domain. So one of the uh, research I did is like trying to create rules. We call it fuzzy rules. So try to create rules like that if protein A is a plasticizer, uh, and uh, if protein is A and plasticizer is B, then percentage of molecule dissolved is X. So you can try to explain that which are the variables and how much or what kind of variable you have used in order to predict something. But this is a very difficult task to do in, in a neural network, which is called black box, uh, if, you, if you have heard of. So there are algorithms in artificial intelligence which can deliver that task. The accuracy will be compromised, but it will deliver the task of explainability.
now I jump to another work, uh, another very interesting work, uh, which I like uh, a lot, is in, in the environment and the build architecture. So understanding the impact of environment and the urban dynamics on humans. So we live in, in this, uh, this world, which is uh, sometime I criticize it, calling it uh, like a, a concrete jungle. Although the Reading where I live, it's a beautiful city, uh, very green. Uh, but imagine uh, you are living in a, uh, in a metropolitan area, which is full of uh, uh, like a buildings. So this research, what we did is we try to understand how humans will perceive their, in, uh, their surroundings, how they are like, uh, they are feeling good or what is their, in, in fact, what is their inner, inner psychology, inner physiology reacts, how their inner physiology reacts to the different uh, dynamics or different, uh, scenarios they see in the environment. So basically, you can think of this work in is going in the direction of uh, assessing the well beings of uh, of the people in in living in the urban urban setting. So in in this work, what you see in this video is that one person uh, or like a person is walking through a beautiful city in I think the most beautiful city in the world uh, is called Zurich in Switzerland. So the people are walking uh, in a different areas of the, the uh, city called Zurich, and they are observing different things like a traffic, they're observing different types of colors in the building, the different architecture of the building, the greenery around them. Uh, they are feeling even, even the environment, like what is the temperature be like, what is the sound, uh, what is the pollution level like a dust. Uh, so, so there are different factors going on when you, you walk uh, through the city. And we capture all this aspect, uh, like uh, using different sensors. So if you see this person, this person has a backpack and that backpack is full of different sensors. So we let this person walk this city and we collected them. And we now try to analyze this impact. So what we do is that we can uh, plot this whole sensor values on, on, onto a map that what is their in intense value, what is their less value. So we can cluster or different characteristics of the sensor and we can try to map or relate, correlate that to different labels or we can say, let's say binary labels of human perceptions, good or bad. Uh, like a, if, if we use a hard, hard threshold, we can use like a, a, a strong threshold. So here is blue pixels um, and the white pixels are two different types of uh, uh, feelings or say uh, people's response to the environmental dynamics. So the blue ones are the kind of a negative or more, uh, um, more impulsive or more reactive. And, the, the, uh, and these um, white ones are more passive, like they do not reflect, uh, kind of react too much to the surrounding. So you can classify and you can see, if you see there are numbers here in this uh, uh, map, uh, like it looks like a honey cube. Uh, so these numbers are the people. So you can also deeply analyze what, which person has what kind of response. Are there any pattern of, uh, in the type of people receive, uh, I mean, I would be again here, uh, maybe apologize for like a type of gender, for example, male or female reaction to the environment are there is a difference into that, something like that. So, so it's a whole lot of possibility of doing some kind of analysis. So you, you see again, the process here is a data collection, is a data science process. You collect data, you apply some, uh, uh, do some pre-processing, you apply some deep learning or, uh, or any kind of machine learning algorithms. Here it is unsupervised machine learning algorithm, which is called self-organizing map. And then you try to learn the data. So here the question, first question, understanding the data. We are just understanding the data. So there are this kind of work. Now I, again, I come to another engineering work is a civil engineering work. Uh, in, in this work, we try to do some kind of optimization. We try to uh, optimization as well as try to do some kind of prediction. So civil engineering is, a, is like this urban environment, this whole stuff is built by uh, like bridges and bridge and, and, and mega structures. Civil engineers are responsible for all those things which uh, humans are frightening of if, if you consider my previous research. So 
what we are trying to do in this research, we are trying to see that if this structure fails and when it fails. So we are, we are trying to predict or as well as we are trying to analyze it. So uh, like, let's say example of bridge. So if you have bridge and uh, the, the bridges can collapse. Uh, one of the example I can take is like this. Uh, I think you know what this uh, dome is, okay? So this dome, um, you can have a miniature version of it. It's just a dummy example. So miniature version, like uh, just a laboratory example. And if that dome collapse, uh, it will follow this, uh, you know, this, I don't know how to say it, like curvy path. So that will be the behavior of its uh, uh, collapse or different uh, nodes and a structure of this uh, uh, this uh, arc, uh, this system would behave like this. So the equilibrium of this whole system will follow this path. That is an expected behavior in uh, if we consider and uh, a traditional civil engineering approaches like arc length, as in this example. So we are applying a force on this, like gravity, for example, and it's it's is having an equilibrium impact on on the falling of this dome. So we can trace. But this is an extremely hard problem, which uh, when I try to solve this, I, I wasn't uh, at the beginning able to solve at all. So the optimization was not working. And after lots of, uh, of uh, like uh, using lots of intuition, lots of uh, modification to the algorithms, existing machine learning, uh, the, the artificial intelligence algorithms, we are able to find some kind of a, a, a new algorithm. Uh, like uh, moving into the hyperspace. So you can think of like a, a sphere or which is rolling into, um, into in a hyper dimension and that uh, is able to solve this optimization problem. So it's not only the, in AI is the, is the, is the difficulty for a, uh, a, a, for your problem domain person, like you are doing in industry. It's not only difficulty for you to solve things uh, using AI, it's also the this question which I said that as an AI researcher, I would ask this question, how I will solve it. And when I try to answer this question, how I am going to solve it, I'm going to find different types of algorithms. So we are finally able to manage, uh, manage to solve at least some part of this, uh, this problem. Then uh, we took another, uh, another example. So this is a beam or, or you can see, think of like a bridge, a small bridge is collapsing. Uh, the question is how we can trace or predict this uh, collapse of this bridge. So we can apply our algorithm, which we have just uh, uh, found it, uh, or new algorithm, which we discovered, and we can apply it to solve this one. And what we do is that we have this bridge and we can see the predictions. Now we come to the another uh, example. Sorry, is Barrel, physics. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but we're kind of running out of time. So if you've okay. got about another five minutes, Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. So in physics, uh, this problem could be like uh, solving uh, what kind of uh, silicon uh, solar cells you will find, which will be useful for a roof or uh, would be for a, a, a toy or something. So you can do some kind of optimization and you can uh, do kind of a trade-off between aluminum and silver or type of doping you use. So again, it's a cost and efficiency trade-off. Then in the biology, you can do like a food production where you can try to maximize uh, or uh, uh, like uh, find a gene or you can do like a metabolic engineering. We can tweak the genetic code and you will be able to produce like an optimal strain. Uh, these days, this word is familiar because of this uh, COVID-19, you know, uh, aware of this uh, genetic things. So we can manipulate the genes and we will be able to find a strain which is uh, most optimal. So that is the task we can do as well uh, using AI. In, in the hydrology, we will be able to predict uh, uh, how, uh, when we can, uh, when the water is rising or we can predict the flood with a high accuracy. In climate science, we'll be able to understand the, the, uh, the, the chaotic systems, like uh, uh, when, uh, how to, how the errors growing in the chaotic system, or can we replace a chaotic system or the, the climate models with a neural network? So we can do that task, or we even we can analyze that uh, what regions or what are the, uh, the domains of this uh, system where we are difficulty in doing applying machine learning or where we are it, where it is easy to apply machine learning. So that is kind of uh, various different types of analysis we can do. Now I come to 
two examples, again, uh, from computer science, a final year project from this are two student project. So one is like for uh, a social work uh, or, or impactful work like a noise pollution detection. So traffic noise in England looks like this. That's a very current data. Uh, you will be able to apply a neural network or deep learning uh, to predict what kind of noise it is, whether this noise coming from a, uh, uh, from a construction work or it's from a car honking or something. So you will be able to detect all of these things. Uh, one of the critical problem is a poly plastic pollution. So again, you can apply some semantic segmentation deep neural network to, uh, to, uh, to recognize if there is a plastic garbage or something. So this is complex framework you can apply and you can detect. Okay, so that's a kind of, you know, uh, the, the, in the river, I, th I think you can recognize some of this water bottle with, uh, with this water, uh, I think smart water, you recognize this bottle, right? So we can kind of uh, detect if that garbage is a plastic and that need an attention. So that what, uh, so there are extremely unthinkable domains where artificial intelligence is, can be applied. And there is no limitations uh, or if you start counting how many tools and techniques or things we have in our pocket, it's enormous. So we, we, as an AI researcher, we will be able to solve, or we can basically create problems to solve AI, uh, solve them using AI. So with that, I think I will uh, complete uh, my uh, this talk, and I'm op open for questions you have. And please don't use plastic. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Varun. Uh, that was a really excellent talk. I thought you beautifully explained um, AI, ML, the deep learning, um, uh, and data science. Um, and I really enjoyed the videos you put through and the speed of that electronic mouse at the end was incredible. Um, <laughs> and I also, I also really enjoyed that sort of showcase of all the different challenges and sectors that AI can be applied to. And I particularly enjoyed the sort of perception of the environmental work. I hadn't really seen that sort of described before, so I really enjoyed that. Um, okay, thank you. So I've got a, one sort of a very quick question um, regarding the slide of the perpetual experience. Um, I just want a clarification on what the purple cells were and what the white cells were. So the the, the purple cells uh, were uh, people uh, experience like uh, strong emotions or a strong reaction to changes in the environment and the white cells were where people feel comfortable or you can say they have no reactions Thanks. or more passive reaction. Um, and then we had we had a question which then sparked a really interesting philosophical debate in the chat. Um, so when AI learns by watching how humans learn, how can we mitigate the risks of it learning bad habits or applying real world biases? Yeah, so, so there are research work, like uh, uh, one example could be, uh, there was debate about uh, the, uh, the bias in the interview. If you do a video interview or AI is doing a scanning your CV or is scanning your, uh, taking your video interview that is happening uh, in this current world. So how to avoid uh, the bias? So the bias starts from the data level itself. So you produce a data where, I mean, I, again, I will be using controversial words like only white people then your neural network will learn to be, uh, to think that all the white peoples are only intelligent. Okay, so that is the bias introduced. So what you will do is that you will uh, prepare your data set with the, the representative uh, system, kind of a set of people. So you put like uh, people from all ethnicity in your data set. Then if you create a neural network that will learn to think that, okay, that's a diversity here and we have to uh, respect that diversity. So that would be like my straightforward answer. Yeah. So there's kind of an interesting sort of to and throw on that. And some were saying about, you know, these sort of bad habits as defined by who, you know, for example, the fastest route or the route with the lowest carbon footprint. You know, and what's optimal today may not be the optimal choice later on. Um, and then that was that question of, you know, who should have responsibility for the curation of what is ethical training data? You know, is that, yeah. Uh, so th this is a e part of ethics side. As I said at the very beginning, there are challenges in AI, which is concerned about ethics. And this is not a subject area which I'm an expert in, but what my understanding or the solution is to create a uh, representative data set. 
at the very beginning. Uh, the, the example which I gave a very straightforward example is that if you create a bias data set or if you by mistake create a bias data set, that will lead to a bias system or unethical system. So the, the training as how human learns, like we have our own biases towards different things, right? And that is come from our background because we have, uh, we have only a very particular environmental settings to learn. And we can't be blamed for that as a human because we were taught those things. So uh, that, that is exactly how the machine learning or, or this AI system works. If you give them an environment which is uh, not a, a comprehensively representative, it will learn towards that bias. Yeah, makes sense. Um, got a question here about the, uh, the sewer gas monitoring problem. Uh, what is the advantage of using AI-based techniques over classical algorithms? So the AI techniques, um, uh, they are um, the, uh, they are robust, uh, like gas gas mixture example I gave it. So the, the, the classical algorithms will take one sensor and predict for particularly for that uh, uh, sensor, what would be the, the, the proper hazardous label, okay? But the, the thing happened with this gas sensors is that uh, the, in the environment, the gas doesn't stays alone they are in the mix mixture form. So you do not know exactly that this, what, how this pattern of mixing is happening and that will lo lead to certain kind of prediction. So what you can do is you can create a, a, a mixing example. So what in our research we did, we created like a, a 500 samples of different mixing. So we have like a knobs, we are turning it that this is going carbon dioxide is going in this percentage and this is going this percentage and so on and so on. So we created a, a representative mixture like a set of 500 examples and we trained neural network. So the neural network learned this mixing pattern. And so the, the response of the neural network become more robust compared to a traditional algorithms. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Uh, just to say, uh, Varun, again, so many uh, comments in the chat about how excellent your talk was. So um, thank you very thank you. much for that. Thank you for everyone. Um, I think that's all the questions for now. Um, if anyone come, thinks of any wants to put them in the chat, then um, we can put these to, to Varun later on, I'm sure. Um, so I will think I'll now um, going to hand over. So thank Varun again. And I'm going to um, hand over to Professor Richard Mitchell, um, who is a professor in cybernetics at the University of Reading. And he's going to talk about a new scheme from the Department of Computer Science, which makes it easy for business to collaborate on a project with final year students. Thanks. Over to you, Richard. Yeah, um, Varun's going to do the slides um, so I can just talk. I, I would say that we in well, I've worked with lots of different departments over many years, uh, including quite early on. Uh, we talked to people from agriculture and uh, they, there was a bit of an interest in AI and one of my colleagues who was working there, he w went into the um, uh, the common room there and he announced to the whole of the agriculture department that he'd just been to a demonstration of AI. And there was a pause and a stunned silence. And then the head of department said, well, actually there are two types of AI and one's got more bull than the other. Anyhow, that's a slight aside. What I'm gonna talk about now is a new scheme that we're uh, introducing in computer science department to help uh, cooperation with industry, but specifically on final year projects. Now, Varun's already shown a couple of examples of final year projects, what our finalists are capable of doing. And we're interested in seeing how we can engage more with industry to hopefully help both the student as well as industry itself. All right, next slide, please. Um, so as a background, one third of the final year of the computer science degree is an individual project, student working on their own with a supervisor and so forth. Now we provide a whole list of possible projects the students can do, um, but the students themselves are able to propose their own. What we then have to do is to check that that proposal is of the right standard. Um, normally, the difficulty is not that they're trying to make it too easy, they're trying to make it too hard, but we do that. We do find sometimes that a project that is suggested is one that has come from industry. It might have come because a student will have had a whole year doing a placement or perhaps a summer placement where they've done a bit of work and they could see 
in conjunction with the person they've worked with in industry, ah, this could be a good final year project. So again, a project can be proposed. And again, we check that it is of the right standard. And this new initiative is to try to formalize what has been a bit of an ad hoc process. Yep. So we called it COFI. Um, and these are the objectives of it. One is support business. We've done a lot of work with industry over the years in different schemes, for instance, knowledge transfer projects and the like. So we're used to working with industry and we know that it can be beneficial to industry to have some academic involvement. So hopefully, if you've got an idea, then the, the student can work on the project and it could be useful to you. It also will help improve the readiness of students for going out in, into industry. So as I say, some of our students do placements, um, but some don't. They just want to study for their degree. But it's useful if they have some experience of industry. Uh, other objective is to help engaging in collaborative projects because what we perhaps jointly get a, a student to do might um, lead on to a more comprehensive project. And that will help to continue to develop the relationship we have between industry and the department. And as I say, it can potentially lead to opportunities for further research projects with the staff. Yeah. So why would you perhaps want to get involved on how? Well, the idea is you will propose either a research or a development project, which you think is key to your business, which is achievable by a student working on it for a third of the year. You come up with the idea and we will assess whether it's suitable. Perhaps have a dialogue to say, well, actually this is a bit too far, but could you reduce it to that and make it achievable? Um, it will help you to gain some extra resource and a fresh perspective from the next generation of students. Our young students, they have some really good ideas sometimes and you could benefit from those. Also, it'll help you to, uh, to build a relationship with the university. And there are lots of benefits for doing that for, because you can have an opportunity to meet with different academics, find out about some of the research that's going on and, and so forth. In terms of what are we asking of you, we're not asking for any financial commitment, only your time. And that time will just be one hour per week during the autumn and the spring term to meet with the students and the supervisor at the Reading University as well. Now, you won't have to do thing, boring things like marking. Uh, we, we all do that. We don't necessarily enjoy doing the marking, but we'll do that bit of it. But we'll be, we'll be there to check that things are going along okay, but we're interested in what you're doing. And in terms of the intellectual property, it will be your business's intellectual pro property of the, the project outputs. Yep. So how do you get involved? It's quite simple. Submit a project proposal, give your company name and a brief description of it, contact details, uh, title of the project, a 200 word outline and what the objectives are. And then once we've got those, um, there'll be a panel of academics who will evaluate it and then we'll lead on to uh, a project being assigned to the project. One person from your company will be a co-supervisor, but there will be the main supervisor will be a member of the academic team here at Reading. Um, you've got a URL there and you've got a nice QR code. And that's the Kofi scheme. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Richard. Um, I also just like to say just how impressive the Department of Computer Science students are. We've been very fortunate to have a couple work as interns um, here at the Hub. I've been hugely impressed by them. Um, as uh, we've also worked with the presidents of the RU Hacking Student Society and, and, and seen the outputs of the fantastic hackathon events that they've run. So, you know, they, they really are, um, you know, a, a very good group there. Um, I'm now going to That's hacking for the, in, a, in a good way. By the oh, way. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, so we're now going to hear from Rakesh Pankamia on the University of Reading's internship scheme. scheme. Um, over to you, Rakesh. Thank you. Um, so um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for, um, for, for everyone performing. So Richard and Varun um, 
uh, given a really interesting talk and really interesting scheme as well um, uh, uh, for everyone to take part in. Um, I'm just going to begin sharing my screen just about the Reading Internship Scheme. So bear with me one second. There we go. Yeah, so I've just started. Working. Yep, that's great. So um, my name's Rakesh and I am the Reading Internship Scheme Coordinator. I look after the Reading Internship Scheme, um, which um, is part of the University of Reading's careers team. Who, um, careers team. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of uh, the scheme. So um, the Reading Internship Scheme is one of our flagship um, schemes within the university which allows you to connect with um, with our undergraduates for a four to eight week internship. Oh, excuse me. Um, working with our students um, um, in a four to eight week internship will let, uh, allow you to um, work on a project that you uh, may have going on in your organisations or if you're looking for a fresh uh, perspective um, from a student, um, the scheme may be really good, uh, uh, good for you. Um, we pay our internships on our on the Reading internship scheme, um, £9.50 an hour, which we um, which we provide funding to you, which I'll cover a little bit later on. And they, um, all of our um, undergraduates um, apply for um, the internships that you may be uh, looking to offer to them um, on our online jobs uh, portal where we do all the advertising and retrieve the applications for, uh, for you. So to give a bit more in-depth uh, in information, we provide um, four, uh, six or eight week internships with our undergraduates, which are either remote based or office based internships. Um, it's just still say um, if COVID is secure, that just depends on um, the way uh, your organisation may be uh, working at the moment. And um, we offer um, for our internships um, it being part time if it's during the term time where they work up to 20 hours a week and it's it equals the same amount of time as what a um, full time um, student would work in the holiday period. So um, our full time internships during the uh, um, during the vacation periods is 35 hours a week. So for a four week internship. Um, that is a full time um, amount of hours. That's 140 hours for a part time role. Um, they would do um, to up to 20 hours a week until they do 100, uh, 140 hours, for example. Um, we provide 50% um, of the um, intern salary um, for any of the internships that are part of the Reading Internship Scheme, if you're a profit earning organisation, or if you're a charity or a not-for-profit organisation, we give you 100% of the um, intern salary for um, the internship that they come on uh, to uh, the internship scheme as well uh, for you. We... I do apologise. Uh, I'm using a using a laptop that's not mine, and it's very sensitive. Um, so um, when we do um, go through, um, say, if you do take part in the internship scheme, we um, provide you the funding through uh, purchase order system, and you uh, by providing you a purchase order, and then uh, you provide us with an invoice where you take on the intern through um, your pay as your own system. And any on costs are not included in the grant as well. And as I mentioned earlier, the Reading in Internship Scheme um, team, so myself and the rest of the Careers Centre, promote these to the students and send you the applications. You would then shortlist um, the um, applicants that we send on to you. And we're on hand throughout the internship to support you. And if you have any questions, come back come back um, you can always come back to us uh, regarding them we're really looking for employers who want to offer uh, students a genuine learning experience and like I said before if you're looking uh, to get a fresh perspective on a project that you're working on or just need that extra resource where they can learn um, some skills um, whilst uh, whilst taking part um, in the scheme with yourselves that's what um, 
is the main goal, which is a real win-win for, for everyone. So a little bit more about our students so that can take part in the internship scheme. So it's all of our undergraduate students. So that's from first year to, to final year um, that can take part in the um, scheme. It is one of the uh, schemes, which is an extracurricular one. So it's not part of any um, courses that they do. So the only things um, that we, um, any things that we would normally ask for is just um, just details on who you've selected and then it's just um, a small agreement between uh, the universities and yourselves just to say that you're providing an internship with uh, the organisation as well. As again, as I mentioned, we ask employers to consider the, uh, students for their skills and experiences when, uh, when if you are looking uh, for it. Uh, for an intern uh, in the scheme, rather than solely on their degrees as well um, at times. However, um, uh, we do have uh, internship opportunities where if you are looking for, um, say for example, which um, I imagine is very relevant uh, to this uh, hub um, is uh, like computer science, we, we can um, we can then uh, market it out to our computer science students as well, or those who are interested in um, in uh, the fields as well. Um, feedback has shown in the past as well. Um, I think this is um, this is um, this is probably the either the fifth or sixth year that this scheme is going. That you know, having a student come in um, to bring a fresh perspective and extra resource to. Um, to a project that you may have is a real benefit to yourselves as well. Um, so if, if you are new to the scheme, um, how the funding works is we add you onto the finance system and we will get um, uh, our finance team to verify your bank details. Once you have recruited um, an intern, um, we create a purchase order and that purchase order is then sent to um, yourselves and then you will invoice us on uh, for the funds on the first day of the in intern's uh, day of work. Um, once the uh, once the funds reach you, you are then to pay uh, the intern through uh, pay as you earn system. Um, when deciding on a project, um, I always suggest um, think about any projects that you have going up at the moment, or if there's a project that your organization needs, has a need for, that would be really good. That would be really uh, beneficial uh, to not only yourself, but a student to take part in. That That is um, really, you know, the place where we would, ex we would kind of be saying, actually, this would be really good for you to take, have on the Reading internship to take part in. And again, as I said as well, um, it's, um, you know, as, if it's a project where you think it will benefit you and offer that learning experience as well, that's um, that's where I would really suggest that this scheme is really beneficial to yourselves. And, um, you know, if you do are interested in it, I'll provide the details later on on how you can take part in the scheme as well. Um, these are just a few of our past ones that we've had. So we've had a wide one. So even if it is, it's a little bit more of a wider thing that you may be thinking um, that's not so specific into a certain project as well. We've had a wide range of things um, with um, organisations that have uh, been in, um, that have been um, uh, job opportunity, job internship opportunities that uh, with such a range of uh, organisations as well. Um, that we've had so it doesn't have to just be a specific one one on a project as well if it is a bit more of a one in a different department to uh, um, say for example like I said about uh, the computer science students you know that that is an option as well to do um, we also have on our employer web pages um, I'll be providing a um, the slides later on as well. And um, if you are interested in the scheme, um, I've um, on the, at the end of these slides, it will have my email on there. But we have on our employer web pages um, um, some frequently asked questions and some guidance on um, remote working and uh, support as well. Um, but I imagine a lot of us are quite well aware of um, working from home over the last two years. As, as well uh, there. Um, 
we also have an employer handbook which has um, job description tips, um, um, how we upload um, uh, vacancies onto the online jobs portal and how to onboard um, the intern as well. So okay, if you so are... Sorry oh, to interrupt, Rakesh, oh, but we're sort of running out of time. Oh, so I'm just on the last slide there oh, as perfect. well. So okay. thank you. <laughs> that's not a problem. So if you are interested or curious about the Reading Internship Scheme in a bit more detail, um, email me on the um, on this slide as well. The slides will be um, uh, sent to you as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to get my contact details. I will pop my um, LinkedIn um, um, details as well in the chat as well. And I can send you the employer handbook, which goes through the internship scheme in a lot more detail for you as well. Um, thank you for your time and I'll pass you back back over to um, Sarah and if you do have any questions feel free to um, ask them away. Brilliant, uh, thank you Richard, um, thank you Rakesh. Um, can I just, uh, could you just confirm the deadline for um, applying for the internship scheme? So have we missed the deadline for this year or is, is, it, is that still possible? No, it's still open. So um, we have, we, we have, um, we have it open until uh, summertime. Um, for any internships, um, I, I would recommend um, uh, getting in contact with myself sooner rather than later because funding is limited as well. And once it's gone, it's gone as, as well for this academic year. Um, interns can work up until uh, mid, mid September. So the earlier you get it in, the more earlier I can advertise them out to our students as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, well, that, you both explained those schemes really well. Um, don't have any other further questions. Um, thank you for sharing your LinkedIn details, Rakesh, and we will circulate that further information around uh, when we circulate the slides. Um, so I, I'd just like to say a final thank you to all our speakers for coming today um, to share their experiences. I really enjoyed today's talk. Um, thank you for all, you know sharing your details in the LinkedIn and, um, and, and, and contributing in the chat. Um, and I'm just going to um, share a quick slide now to sort of tell you a bit more about what we've got coming up. Um, so hopefully we'll see you at our future events. Um, as you know, we were recently successfully awarded a Turing Network Development Award by the Alan Turing Institute. Um, so for the next six months, we're going to be focusing activity around the areas of computer vision, environmental science and the creative arts. Um, so please do keep an eye out on our LinkedIn and our website for more details. Um, anyway, that's that's all from me. Um, I hope you all have a lovely evening um, and um, I hopefully see you again soon. So that's goodbye from me. Thank you very much.